morning. Praise the Lord. It's Friday afternoon. I'm sitting in my house. I'm eating my dinner. I'm watching some television. And the Lord started speaking to me. And I was going to continue watching TV, but he did not want me to do that. He wanted me to write down what he was talking to me about. And he was talking to me about joy. So I sat down and I started writing some things and I want to share those with you this morning. And this is what I wrote. How great it is when we receive the Lord in our hearts. Your life changes completely. You become a new person. Things that you used to do, you don't do anymore. Things you liked before, you don't like anymore. Things you used to say, you don't say anymore. This is because those were worldly things. Some people say that when a person is born again, the changes in that person are just an act, that we all revert back to our old selves. I disagree. When you have been touched by the Holy Spirit, you cannot help it but to act in a different way. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27 says, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see, I have changed. I am not the same person I was a year and a half ago. People around me tell me all the time, you're a different person, Robert. I know I am. I have noticed the people around me have also changed the way they act when they are with me. I get, to work every, I get to work every morning with a smile, and they ask me, why am I so happy? There's a lot of reasons to be happy. Let me give you a few reasons why. I get to wake up every morning. I get to talk to my mother. I have a place to work. Or how about the fact that this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I have been blessed in many ways. I have been promoted at work five times in four years. I won an award that I did not know I was nominated for. I was chosen to be part of a group of people that the business tasked to work on special high-level projects. People come to me for advice. I have a friend that just recently said, if it wasn't for Robert, I would have quit this job already, but he's the reason I am able to keep my sanity, and that's why I don't leave. And this person is a non-believer. Th that is how I know that it is not me why she says things like that or things that way, but because of Christ that shines through me. You see, I put my life in the Lord's hands and he lifted me up. My life has not been the same since. Romans 8.13 says, For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I called him and he came. He came and he healed me. He came and refreshed me. He came and washed my sins away. This is the reason, folks, why I get up in the morning and say to myself, I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. Let the Lord touch you. Let him put his spirit within you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? I guarantee you that once you are touched by the Holy Spirit, you will be overcome with a joy that cannot be taken away. So, I wanted to share that with you guys this morning, and with that, I open the floor for anyone that would like to share a testimony or request prayer. Yes.
They never went to a movie because it was somehow evil. Because they watched it on TV and that was okay. <laughs> Anyhow, we are living in a time right now that the saints have, they're going to have to draw on the word of God. Yes, sir. Because we don't see all of the miracles that are written about in the book. Does that mean that they cease? No. No, it just means that our ways are not his ways. Thank you. 
And just as the poor and the needy realize it quicker that they need something, the wealthy don't, but they all will need him. And we just have to realize that our, our job, and we need to do it everywhere we are. I don't care whether you're on the job, whether you're here, on each other, but introduce people to Jesus Christ. Yeah. He is everything. When he said, I am that I am, Anyone else? All right, well, let's stand. I left my channel on. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us the joy that we have, Father, by receiving your word, by being in your presence, by receiving the assurance of your word, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we put our lives in your hands. We lift up those that are in need of healing, those that are in need of a breakthrough, whether it's financial, whether it's relational. Father, we ask that you protect those that are going to travel. Keep them safe. Know that you are in charge. You are holding them in your hands and keeping them safe. Lord, hallelujah, Lord. Continue to give us revelation, Lord, so we can go out into the world and introduce others to you. Jesus, that we know. Jesus, that we have experience. Thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings and everything that you have done for us for changing our lives, for making us new creatures. Let them see your glory, Lord. Let us your glory, Each generation needs to see your glory, Lord.
don't have any announcements. Let's take the word. Will you not revive us again? May your people may rejoice in you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I received the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Hallelujah. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now the solved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Marge and Donnie, will you please take the offering? And Mark, can you say the blessing? your glory, Lord, this day. Hallelujah. It's time to rejoice. Hallelujah. Y'all ready? Second song. That second song. Okay. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in the world. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Celebrate the presence of the Lord. He is worthy
Hallelujah. Thank you. Declared in this room already this morning. Who knows? Got to be ready for anything around here. This joy that I have. start breaking loose like we know are going to happen. Uh, we got to dig. We got a well that's deep. We got a well that's wide. We got a Lord that loves on us and just got to keep our eyes upon him. Be ready for anything, church.
Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Give us eyes to see. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. Oh. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we wouldn't know you want to move in our midst, Lord. All of creation calling out to you, Lord. Fourth Lord.
bears a cry. It stirs my heart. Ancient cry. Desperate prayer. It's a cry. The Moses pray. We're here today. As I board on a plane this coming week to go up to New England, I pray the Lord would show me the, the paths that even Charles Finney had when he was up in that area when the Lord was moving so mightily. As we celebrate my grandma's 100th birthday, 
I also want to celebrate the move of God that happened years ago. But I know the Lord wants to move in our midst here, now. There's been a birthing pain going on for months, even years. Sunday was here about a hundred years ago. Here in Des Moines, there was a move of God. The Spirit moved so mightily that bars closed. Even licenses were revoked. Lifestyles were changed. The spirit of alcohol, that spirit was lifted from this area. I believe it was a precursor to what's to come. That was just a taste of what the Lord wants to do in this area. May the heartland have the heart of God. May the heartland reveal the heart of God. Lord, reveal, reveal, reveal to this generation growing up right now. They need to see your power, even as it was stated earlier today. They're even going after Ouija boards and other things, the Lord, that are not of you. Lord, let there be a spiritual manifestation in this region that would touch not only us, but the next generation, that they would see you. They would see you, Lord. Not religion, not doctrine, Lord. Not churchiosity, Lord. They need your glory. Show us your glory, Lord. singing this last song that when Moses asked to see the glory of the Lord, what he saw was a the hinder part of God or what was to come which was Jesus. Yes. Well, if this world's going to see the glory, it's going to have to see it the same way. That's right. And we're the only body, we're the only representation that God has on this planet. So when we say, show us the glory, we're talking to us. If we want the manifestation, then we have to be willing receptacles for the Lord. From everything that was said here today about the way we testify, the way we live our lives. I'm not talking about personal holiness as such. I'm talking about representing God in honesty and truth. And likewise, if we want a manifestation here, then somebody's got to lay hands on the sick. Somebody's got to prophesy. Somebody's got to cast out devils. And it has to be us. God isn't going to come and just show up here absent us. He's not doing that anymore. He's chosen a body. And Jesus went away so that we could be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do greater works than he did. So we can be waiting on the Lord, and all the time the Lord's waiting on us. <laughs> Praise yeah. the Lord. We just need to be bolder. We need to come boldly to the throne of God by grace and make the demands. 
place the demands that God has given us a right to demand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast the devils. But we've got to do it. He's not going to do it without us. He's made a decision, and that decision was manifested in Christ, and then Christ has, has made us all co-inheritors with him to do this work. Praise the Lord. We, if, if there's somebody, you, you know, we just need to be sensitive. All of us know this. We, we get unctions. We need to follow up on them. If the Lord tells you to pray for somebody, pray for them. Lay hands on them. Yes, pray for them. If yes. the Lord tells you to prophesy to somebody in this service or wherever you are, yes. then give them what the Lord's given you. That's the, that's the way manifestation takes place. Amen. Think about any, any move of God that there's been. Call it whatever you want, revivals, uh, whatever. God has had to use some man or woman or several men and women in order to bring that to pass. How much greater could it have been if we hadn't limited it to a man or a woman and allowed the body to operate the way it's supposed to? We've experienced the glory of the Lord to some degree here this morning because we've heard his voice. How did we hear it? Through us, through you, through, through the people that spoke. God, you know, the audible voice of God is us. Amen. It's not some echoing, thundering, bass, Bill Cosby sound coming out of heaven. It's whatever we sound like is what God's going to sound like. And all we have to do is just stay in line with his word. And we have every right to declare anything that's in this Bible and expect it to come to pass. And the whole earth will see the glory. And throughout eternity, his glory will continue to be revealed through his grace that it was extended to us. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise God. Great job as always. You know, I, I get asked on a frequent basis, you know, what's this church do? What's it, you know, what's our theology? Uh, in fact, as recent as uh, Thursday, someone asking me about the, basically they're asking what do you preach, you know, what do you believe, and that sort of thing. And uh, I would like this church to just be one that focuses on Jesus. That's, that's the thing that will draw people to God. Now you can draw people to buildings, you can draw people to personalities and, and uh, charismatic uh, kind of uh, behaviors and so forth. But all of that is worthless if they're not brought to Jesus. So I don't worry so much about trying to explain doctrine because usually all that does is create an argument. But the one thing we can agree on with all Christians, if they're truly Christians, is that Jesus is the focus. He's the beginning and the end and everything in between. So, you know, I, I think about uh, Mary and Martha. The scripture talks about uh, Martha was busy with a lot of stuff. Uh, and Mary just sat at the feet of Jesus. Now, religion would say what Martha said, and that's, uh, come on, Lord, uh, don't you care that I'm out here doing all this work and she's just sitting here? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you know, you're troubled by many things and, and distracted with all this, but Mary has chosen the good thing to just focus on Christ. He wasn't asking for a meal. He wasn't asking. He, look, he could have. He, he fed thousands. He didn't need Martha sweating in the kitchen. He, he, what he needed, what he wanted, was focus on him. Why? Because he wanted to forgive things. He wanted to release things. He wasn't asking for something. 
He's not asking for something from us. He wants us to have to receive from him. That's what the world needs to know. They've been told you got to do, 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 and that's why they're, they're struggling with everything because they can't do it. None of us could do it, even though a lot of us tried. You know, just like with Peter, the Lord's going to wash their feet, and Peter oh, so, oh, not me. You know, I should be washing your feet. We need, to, we need to learn to let the Lord wash our feet. He's wanting to do for us. He's not asking us to do for him. He doesn't need us to do for him. What he wants because of who he is, he needs to pour out his love. He, he wants to bless you. He wants to do for you. And we're, we're like, oh, gosh, you know, I don't deserve this. And, no, you don't deserve it. That's the point. It's a gift. It's free. All of it is free. Everything in God is a gift. None of it can be earned. Or it wouldn't be by grace. Then it wouldn't be God who got the glory. It would be you sharing glory with God. And he said, that's what I'm not going to share with anybody. Look at, let's look at a couple scriptures here. This isn't actually my text, but I just want to lead into this a little bit. Romans 5, 19, Mike. You know, within the body of Christ, I would dare say within this building, just with this group, we've got different revelations. And we have, we have some that's in common, right? But then we have some that isn't necessarily common to all of us. But that doesn't mean one of us are better, or some of us are better than others. It just simply means we are in a little bit different place. The enemy has used this kind of thing against the church for millennia. That's why we've got all these denominations and can't even sit down together and discuss anything without having a big fight. And even within the denominations, there's splits all the time. And that's the devil. That, God never intended it to be that way. And that's one reason why the glory of God is not being revealed everywhere as it should be. Because we're so busy fighting amongst ourselves, when we go to the lost, we've got to spend half our time justifying our position against what somebody else's is. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Now get this. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. By one. Only one person is being obedient here. But because of that obedience, many are made righteous. It isn't about my church, your church, that church, this church. It's about his obedience. It isn't about my rules or your rules or my obedience to those rules, but it's about his being obedient to God. Okay, look at uh, 2 Corinthians Chapter 10 and verse 5. Now, this is kind of interesting because this is a scripture we very seldom ever uh, really pay a lot of attention to. Casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to what? The obedience of Christ. Not me, not you, but his obedience. Yeah. Every thought that we have, every time the enemy comes and tells you, 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 you don't deserve this because you haven't done enough. You haven't been obedient enough. You've failed. You've done this. He says we're supposed to be concentrating on the obedience of Christ. That's where our answer is. That's where our victory is. That's where our blessing comes. He purchased it yeah. by his obedience. It's not about our obedience. We have to bring every thought, every negative into agreement that the obedience of Christ has taken care of it. Okay? 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. That's where this comes in as a result of those scriptures. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Why? Because as he is, 
so are we in this world. As he is. Perfect. Righteous. Accepted. My son. My beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now come on, that's Bible. That's scripture. That's where you are right now as a believer. That, this is how the glory of God is going to be revealed. Jesus knew that. He, had, he understood his relationship to the Father as a man. And that's what he's trying to impart to us because it's only through that that we can have everything that the Bible promises. Otherwise, these things are all illusory. You know, they're, they're vague. They're just out of reach, it seems like. But here we have them. We, we possess them. Praise the Lord. How many, how many of you heard of a litmus test? Maybe not almost everybody's heard of those things, right? And what they have is a, there's a, there's a paper that uh, when, you, when you drop the solution on it, if it's an acid, it turns red. And if it's a base, then it turns blue. So you know if you need to add or subtract or take from. They use it in swimming pools. They use it in soils they, in anything. And the truth is, legalists, religious people, love a litmus test. They always have. The Pharisees have always had litmus tests, and they always will. The legalists always have, the legalists always will, because it allows them to know who's in and who's out. Litmus test Christianity is a never a good thing. It causes us to ask the wrong questions. All of us come from different spiritual, religious backgrounds, but we can all relate to this. And I want to talk to you about some things this morning, not, not to be negative, but, but simply to, to cause us to think more Christ-like. What the litmus test mentality does is cause us to pit one part of the body of Christ against another, even within local congregations. Not to mention what can you only imagine between denominations and, and doctrinal issues. So I want to read a couple of scriptures here. Beginning, let's read Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 20 through 23, Mike. And I'll try to move along here and we can. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Need to focus in on that parenthesis. Which all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, not God, all these rules, these regulations, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship? Self-will. I will do the right thing. I will, you know, it's all about ego and individuality and pride and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Praise the Lord. Now, let's look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and verse 11. Now, here's a scripture that we hardly ever see, hear, or talk about to any degree. That you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Wouldn't that be a novel attitude for Christians? <laughs> That's what Paul's promoting. We can be, Don's talked about it, Mark, Roberto, we can have such an influence by just being who we are and taking advantage of the opportunities that God gives us instead of doing what we have done religiously, some of us, in the past, and that's going out and ramming stuff down people's throat and threatening with 
this and intimidating with something else. But just mind your own business and let the Holy Ghost lead you and guide you. Live your life quietly, decently, honorably. Believe me, if you do that, you'll attract attention just by doing that. Right? I mean, this is what Roberto's saying. He's coming in. He's not walking in there with a, you know, a five-by-nine Bible, thumping it. And, no, he just walks in, and he's, he's just happy. He's just showing the joy of the Lord. He's just minding his own business, and people are drawn to it. They say, what's up? What is it about you that makes me want to stay on a job that otherwise I would leave? Something about you is attractive, and I don't know what it is. It's the Holy Spirit. And Paul says we can influence people by just being quiet and doing our own thing and allowing the Holy Spirit to draw people. You know, we all live lives that are unique. We have our own circle of friends and, and relatives and so on and so forth. So God's always putting us in positions where we have opportunities to be a witness. When he opens the door, don't hesitate. But how many of you know you can beat the door down and never get anything but sore fist? You just frustrate and alienate. Praise the Lord. Okay, so this is a good place to start. But now let's go to Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 48. And I want to read through verse 56. So Luke 9, 48 through 56. And then we'll get to moving here. If you can, back up to 48. So it said unto them, Whosoever shall receive, this is Jesus, and he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followed not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Now, you could say that about any, any church that believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior. That there, there's going to be always stuff that you can't agree with. Again, just right here, we, we would have, there would be disagreements right here, and that's healthy. There's nothing wrong with that. But we're not, we're not so foolish as to say, well, then you don't have anything and we should, you know, want a demon on you or something because you don't know what I know or I don't know everything that you know. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now, he, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. Now, you know, uh, the Samaritans and, and the Israelites were not really good. The Israelites hated them. They saw them as curs or, or half-breeds. And the Samaritans obviously were bitter against the Jews because of the way they looked at them. So here comes Jesus, who we know at one point made a special trip to go to Samaria to minister to a woman at the well. But here, he's just going through. The, he's not planning on going there for any reason other than he's on his way to Jerusalem, and it's the closest way to get there. And it says that he, so he sent some of the disciples went ahead to make ready, uh, you know, find a place for him to stay for the night and so forth. But they didn't receive him. The Samaritans didn't receive him. Why? Because his face was as though he'd go to Jerusalem. He wasn't coming there for them. He was on his way to Jerusalem, and they thought, well, then go to Jerusalem and get your house. Or, you know, go there and get something to eat. They were, they were aggravated because it wasn't all about them. Right. You got it? All right. Move on. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? And he turned and rebuked him and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You know, sometimes people, they just don't like your presentation. And I can tell you, I've, I've been with people that said, 
no, the Lord's just going to destroy them. And they were grateful that he would, I mean, in their minds. Why? Because they rejected me. They didn't accept me. They didn't expect, accept my testimony or my whatever it was. But you see, Jesus' attitude is so totally different than what we normally see in church. And yet we just gloss over these things and go right to something that's really threatening and intimidating. And, and then that's what we want to present to people. I'm not, you know, I'm speaking in general terms here. I'm not specifically. But, and, and we wonder why they still wander the streets as drunks. Because there's no hope in that. So I'm just going to try to anesthetize myself as much as possible so I don't have to deal with the pain of this life and the fear of what may be after this. So I, I was saved under old school legalism. And I know it pretty well because I even preached it to some degree. Maybe not as strict as some, but I, I did to some degree. And in that environment, leadership was more concerned about what was in our refrigerators than it was with what's in our hearts. If you had beer or wine or whiskey or whatever, that was going to send you to hell. But a critical and a slanderous spirit was just a character flaw that you had to work through. Honest to God. Now, I'm not mim you know, mocking people of that persuasion. I have, I have friends that I still respect and, 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 and appreciate. But there were other rules, too. No movies. No TV. No dancing. That just destroyed me. That was one I embraced, because I was never much of a dancer. No playing cards. And if you really followed the rules, you didn't even have a game that had dice in it. They'd actually buy those little spinner deals that had 0 to 12, so you didn't have to roll dice. That's how rigid and legalistic the mentality was. <clears throat> Women had to wear dresses, but not short dresses. They couldn't wear pants or that which pertains to a man. Praise the Lord. They couldn't cut their hair. And men had to cut theirs. No beards, no mustaches. All of that was of the devil. Now, I know it's hard to believe if you weren't ever in that. And you wonder why or how would an outdated dress code, a boring diet, hair length, could have anything to do about giving you a stronger testimony. Or how it could make you a better Christian. Again, I'm not trying to be hateful or you know judgmental or critical. I'm just saying. Looking back, it's hard to kind of put it into any kind of where it makes sense. But most of us realize that those kinds of rules and those kinds of regulations have absolutely no power in restraining the flesh. And certainly, it doesn't help you to tell who's right with God and who isn't. Because you'll find as much sin in those environments as you will anywhere else. But the problem is, getting rid of old school legalism doesn't mean that the end of legalism. Right. It just morphs into a new strain, and each one of them with its own set of rules and own set of standards. I could tell you all kinds of stories about people that have approached me because I don't do it like somebody else, or I 
don't do this or don't do that. Why? Because they have a litmus test for what a pastor is or for what a Christian is for that matter. And believe me, they have them for you too. You don't look like one. You know, you don't this, you don't that, you don't whatever. See, new legalism, it may not care about what's in your refrigerator, but instead it has a completely different set of standards. And every brand, every person who's involved in that kind of thing has a set of standards. It has its, has its own take on what standards are most important and what ones are non-negotiable. And that's what I'm trying to get us to a place where we just look to Jesus and let that be the standard. Right. He said it. Yep. Right? His obedience is the standard. And the only way is through his obedience right. and not through ours. Right. Look, let's look at something. Judges chapter 12, Mike, uh, verses 5 and 6. Now, most of you probably have seen this scripture or read about it before because it's kind of an odd thing. But re realize these two factions or these two tribes are both Israeli. The, Gilead, the Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when the Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, then they said unto him, say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. It's like Chinese trying to pronounce certain words. They don't come out right, no matter how educated they are, no matter why, because they just, it's a foreign way of saying. It. Well, even though these are both tribes of Israel, one tribe had a deformed palate or something, something about their speech that made it very hard for them to pronounce H's. So everything came out, instead of a sh sound, it came out a s sound. And that was their test. That was their litmus test to see who was on their side and who was against them. For he looked not, he, he, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passage of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. Because they didn't say things the same way the others said it. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's a lot more to this story than that. It was about uh, Japheth, who was a leader, and they kicked him out because his mother was not an Israelite, and they run him off. And then they get into this battle with the Ammonites, and so they go back and get him and want him to come back now and lead their army. And he said, hey, you know, when I was there, you hated me because of my mother, and now all of a sudden you want me to come back and be your leader. And he said, all right, I'll do this only if after we defeat the Ammonites, I get to remain leader. And they agreed to it. Well, they go out and whip them, and the Ephraimites are mad because they didn't invite them to come in and join in the, the destruction. You didn't let us be part of the battle, you know, so now we're going to kill you by the thousands. All right, praise the Lord. So let me just give you a few examples of this kind of thing. This is, not, this is hardly a definitive list. It's hardly all of them. It's just, it's just a few that I know of, you know, and there's plenty others, but I just want to use these. There's the uh, crazy Christians. Hallelujah. People who see themselves as crazy in love with Jesus. You turn on Christian television and you'll find them. They're in there. Praise the Lord. Now, please, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to mock here. I'm just saying, just as an identifying thing, that we can see what goes on within the body. Their, their litmus test of a true disciple is costly personal sacrifice. You have to voluntarily deprive yourself of something very valuable to you. You see what I'm saying? And their evidence of, of persecution for their faith is highly valued. I mean, they'll do things intentionally to be persecuted so they can testify about the persecution because it's a big deal. 
So there aren't very many who are involved in these things. And you have to have had at least a few leaps of faith where all your friends thought you were nuts. I'm just going to do it, you know, and it's totally absurd, but, right? And, and you got to know that if you haven't intentionally chosen some path of, of suffering, then your commitment to Jesus is going to be questioned by them. You know, if you're living a life that is quiet and relatively peaceful and enjoyable, there's something wrong with you and your relationship with God. Right? If your ultimate goal is to live a quiet and a peaceable life, minding your own business, don't bother to apply. Because they're not going to let you be a part of their game. You'll be pegged to somebody less than a true believer. Somebody who hasn't really made the kind of commitment that needs to be made in order to be used by God. Although the Apostle Paul would disagree with that assessment. Another one is the missionary or missional Christians. And again, I'm not saying these are bad. I'm just saying they got their all, all got, everybody's got their own thing going here for as far as their litmus test for who is and who isn't. And these are Christians that are, that are really committed, but they want to know what you're doing to fulfill the mission of God. And if you don't have a soup kitchen or a clothes closet or a food pantry or uh, bring you know, move from the suburbs to the inner city to uh, tutor, you know, at-risk kids or something, then you're really not a Christian. Now, none of that is bad. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that is their litmus test. That's their judge for whether or not you really are a committed Christian, whether you really have a relationship with the Lord. And if you don't, then you're an uncommitted and questionable Christian. And then there's gospel-centered Christians. And they determine spiritual maturity by, by means of their uh, theological grid, if you will. And, I mean, I could name denominations right now where this is just rampant, but it's, there's some of it everywhere. They're debaters, and they think of themselves as intellectuals. And to be certified as spiritually mature, you need a high IQ. And you need a degree in theology to be taken seriously. Now, they might let you in, but you'll never have any position that amounts to anything without that. You know, they may let you come and sit in the back row, but you're not going to open your mouth and say anything because you have to qualify based on their standard. It wouldn't hurt to have read uh, Jonathan Edwards recently and be able to quote it. It's always impressive. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But without it, you're never going to pass muster as far as they're concerned. They'll never see you as a mature and a dedicated disciple. You're just kind of a hanger-on, a, a peripheral out there on the edge somewhere. And then finally, there's the uh, revolutionary Christian. And again, this isn't everything. I'm just talking about a few here. And for whatever reason, they've been put off by uh, regular church services. Uh, Maybe they don't like the pastor. Maybe they don't, they just don't like the idea of uh, any kind of uh, organization, if you will. No matter how loose it is, if it's a church, it still just doesn't pass muster with them. So if you've ever been hurt, disillusioned, disappointed, I mean, any number of reasons you could follow. But eventually, uh, you have to become a part of a uh, house church. 
I've, I've seen these, these people all along. Now, there's nothing wrong with house church. Don't get me wrong. Right? Any more than there's anything wrong with the other things that I'm talking about in, in, a, in a general term. But those are, th those are just a few examples. And all of these expressions uh, of the Christian faith are trying to emphasize something good. They all have an important place in the kingdom of God. They do. I mean, there are reasons for these things. But they're also teetering on the edge of a dangerous cliff. And this is to what Don was talking about earlier, about us coming together in like mind, in agreement, not with attitudes about others or, you know, what they do or don't or believe or can't believe or whatever. But they, these are also, although there's good that comes from these things, and, and it should be a part of the kingdom of God, because it needs to be in certain areas and for certain reasons. And yet it's dangerous because they're on the edge of this thing. They're allowing their personal passion and their calling to become the litmus test. In other words, if you're not with us, there's something lacking. I mean, if you don't agree with the way we do it, then there's something wrong with you. And so it becomes this litmus test or the, the shibboleth, you know, by which we decide who is in and who's out. Or who is a genuine Christian and who is just a kind of a maybe. It becomes just another legalistic, pharisaical distinction. And here's the reason why it's dangerous. For us personally, for groups, however, however it is. Legalism always leads to a lack of mercy. Except for those that are just like you. They love the idea of mercy, but they want to limit it as to who it's offered to and to how much is offered. Now, I've seen this myself, my own experience, and I know it's true in all of these organizations to some degree or another. Let's look at Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, to those that had gathered, to the Pharisees and to the legalists that were there, he says to them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. Praise the Lord. Uh, Jesus picked this fight. He didn't have to do it that way. He made a point. He made an issue of getting their attention, having them, you know, make a decision one way or the other, and then he deliberately broke a Sabbath law, as far as they were concerned, to prove a point. And Jesus went around picking fights like this all the time. We don't see him that way, but that's the way he was. He could have done things secretly, privately, but he didn't. He, he went out in the, right out in the open and made a show of it. Now, in the eyes of the Pharisees, you've got to realize Jesus was putting the immediate need or the, the obvious need of humanity above adherence or, or faithfulness to the Scripture. So in a way, you can't hardly blame him from where they're coming from, you know what I mean? But he was trying to prove something to them. He was trying to show them the real mind of God, the real heart of God, a real manifestation of God. And what's more... Not, you know, none of the people that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, you go back through all the Gospels and, and check them out, none of them were in grave danger of dying before sundown. It wasn't like he couldn't have waited a few hours 
and it wouldn't have been the Sabbath anymore, and there would have never been any issue about it at all. It wasn't like they were in the middle of, you know, choking to death or having a heart attack or something. These were all things that could have waited. But he made a point of doing it on the Sabbath in front of these Pharisees, in front of these that he knew were going to be just outraged by it. Amen. So why? Why didn't he just wait? Because he didn't care. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He wouldn't listen to their logic. He wouldn't postpone his mercy to fit their timetable. Instead, he kept picking those fights to prove a point. In the kingdom of God, mercy trumps sacrifice. In all of these denominal, individual groups, however you want to put it, God's more interested in mercy than he is in their uniqueness or their sacrifices as they see the need for. He always, mercy tri tri trumps, excuse me, sacrifice, even religious sacrifices, always, no exceptions. <laughs> Get, this is good for us, because it strips us of pride, and it makes it possible for us to love others who are not in total agreement with us to be able to reach out to them, to be able to be friends with them, to be able to... Now, they may not want to. That's their problem. But we can feel free to do it without any compulsion, without any anxiety, without any sense of, well, it'll ruin me to interact with somebody who doesn't agree 100% with me. See, mercy really is more important than sacrifice. That's not a cliche. That's reality as far as God's concerned. It's a kingdom principle. It's what God wants. It's to be applied everywhere. Think about that when you talk to your friend. Not that you were going to condemn him. I'm just saying he's already condemned. This is what Jesus told him. He said, I didn't come to condemn. You've already got one that condemns you. The law, Moses. You're already under that. I've come to set you free from it. I've come to tell you there's a way out of that condemnation. There's a way out of that guilt and that shame. And it isn't by you cleaning up your act. It's about you coming to me and I'll wash your feet. It has to be applied every place in every circumstance, in every situation, even if it drives the religious elite nuts, even if it makes them crazy. See, to the, to the old days or the ancient Pharisees and to the current ones, mercy is a scary thing to offer to anybody, especially to another disciple. You know, a lot of times we're pretty good at extending mercy to the unbeliever or to the person who's outside of the body. But once they get in, oh, man, we draw the line there. Now we've got even more rigid expectations and demands on them. We're afraid that they're going to take advantage of it. I think Jesus was talking to us about this all the time. He said, if a man comes and takes your coat or your cloak, he said, give him your coat, too. You know what that tells me? He won't let him be a thief. You can't take from me what I'm willing to give you anyhow. And to prove the point, if you take the, the, the cloak that I've got on over my coat, I'm going to take my coat off and give it to you too. I won't, I won't let you feel guilty about taking from me. Maybe they'll see it as a permission to, to live a half-hearted life of, you know, kind of mediocre obedience. So? 
that costing us anything? Jesus just isn't that way. To the one guy, he said, the, the rich young ruler comes and he said, Master, what must I do to be saved? Well, you got to, he starts giving him the law because he's asking what he is supposed to do. So he answers him with the law. And the guy's arrogant enough to say, well, all of that I've kept since my youth up. So then Jesus just ups the ante and says, give away everything you got then and follow me. Now, hey, whole denominations have been built around that where you, if you've got more than two dimes to rub together, you can't be a part of their group. Poverty gospel has been just as damaging as the total prosperity gospel. See, Jesus was just saying, whatever you think you have to do, it's going to be more than you can do. So to people who, who fail, people that turn away, it was mentioned here this morning. You see, people, you know, they, they, uh, they lose out with God. That's not true. They're told that they're backsliders or that they're this or that they're that, which is not even, doesn't even exist under the new covenant. Right. So they think that, well, if I ever turn away, because, you know, disappointment comes to people. And depending on their maturity, you know, and their understanding of God's goodness and grace towards them, it's easy to turn away. And say, God doesn't like me. God won't do for me what he's done for others because I haven't been good enough or I haven't done this and I haven't done enough. And, and so people do turn away. But Jesus said if the lost sheep, he'd give up all the others to go find that one. It was a sheep. It was just a lost sheep. It had wandered away. People that sat on the fence. Mediocre, lukewarm, you know, whatever. Because we've been, most of us in church, well, if you're not on fire. But he said, a smoking flask. If there's anything there at all, any life left in that person, he'll fan that life. They're not going to die separated from God. They may not enjoy all the benefits. They may not experience all that they could experience. But God's feeling towards them or attitude towards them doesn't change one bit based on what they are doing or not doing. Jesus continues to offer his extravagant mercy. Another chance and another chance and another chance. I can, I can testify and another chance, and another chance. It's mercy that is excessive. It's undeserved. It's generous. Because it's God. Now, we want a pure church. But Jesus takes a whole different route. He just wants one that's without spot and without wrinkle. And he's the only one that can do the cleaning, the ironing. He makes it without spot and without wrinkle. We try to purify the church, and we destroy it in the process. Because we have our litmus test. You see what I'm saying? This isn't an indictment against anybody else, what they believe or don't believe. I'm just saying it's dangerous when we begin to judge. That's, the Holy Spirit does that. God does that. Our job is to be merciful. If we're going to present Jesus, if his glory is going to fill the earth, there has to be some people that are acting like him. 
And I'm not talking about holy in ourselves. I'm talking about just being at peace and quiet and living your own life in Christ. And you will be a magnet. You'll draw people. He said it. If you, if you, if you follow him, you will draw people to you. We've been crucified with him. He said that's what the cross does. It's a magnet. It draws people to God. We carry our own crucifixion in Christ. And believe it or not, if we learn to live from that mercy, it's people can't they can't uh, they can't turn away from it. You know, it's just it's like they're drawn to it. And you'll find then that wherever you are, even though you may think at the moment that it's not where you want to be, not where you ought to be, you'll find out that it's exactly where you're supposed to be. Because God will draw people to you, people that are in that same circle. And for you to move to where you want to go, you've got to just be sensitive where you're at. Sometimes the place where we're at is the best place of all. We just don't know it. Right. I mean, I use this you know, analogy all the time, but we go on vacations every once in a while. And I know I used to think that like this. We'd go on vacation. I mean, we used to go down to Missouri to the lakes, and every once we'd stay someplace where they'd have a pool and, and close to the lake. And, of course, you know, you're not doing anything except sitting around and eating and playing a little golf maybe, swimming, fishing, not paying any bills. Not getting any phone calls. It's heaven. Man, I want to move here. I want to move down here. I, I don't know how many times we've done, you know, been places. And I, I just, I'd like to live here. Yeah. Not if I lived there. Yeah. I want to be somewhere else because now all the junk that I left wherever I was living before is now here. Right? right? right. Sometimes we think it's always better someplace else because. We just don't like dealing with whatever it is we're dealing with here. But it'll, it'll happen there too. But if you learn to be at peace, which is all that was being talked about here this morning, trusting that where you are is where you sit. God doesn't make mistakes. Now, it may not be comfortable. You might not like it. But it doesn't mean you have to be there forever. But that is where you are now. So just try to calm down. Try to rest in Jesus and see if he doesn't start doing supernatural things around you. And believe me, when God starts moving around you, things change. Yep. Even the crooked places get made straight. You know, the low places are raised up, the high places are brought down. Everything gets leveled off. Right. And you might find that the reason for all of the confusion and chaos where you're at is because of demonic influences that God is trying to overcome, but he needs somebody to cooperate with him. Hey, if you're going through a bunch of crap, it ain't God. There's an enemy out there who wants to get you to give up. You may be a tremendous threat. In fact, you are a tremendous threat to his kingdom of darkness, wherever that is. He'd like nothing better than to get you to throw up your hands and get discouraged and just walk away from it. But I got news for you. You're a child of light. So the next place you go, there's going to be darkness there too. That's the way it is. That's the world we live in. But God has empowered us through his grace to show mercy even as we receive mercy. Whether they're in the church or out of the church. Amen? Amen? We just need to just let God's love and mercy and grace flow and watch what it'll do. It'll reveal the glory of God and people will be drawn to him. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Not only that, it takes all the weight off of you to feel like you've got to make decisions about, well, I don't know about this person and that person, even our own children sometimes. God's good. God's got it under control. We just need to trust him. Amen? God bless all of you. Have a great 4th of July if I don't see you here Wednesday. 
uh, celebrate our nation's birthday and uh, let's let's make it a good birthday hallelujah and hope that the uh, coming years will be what this nation was built to be amen and by the grace of god it will be hallelujah you're dismissed in jesus name